The story begins with a young boy staggering down the road, bloodstains on his body, injured for some unknown reason. Just then, Mike happens to pass by, quickly scooping the boy into his car and rushing him to the emergency room at the hospital. Soon, the boy's parents arrive, first expressing their gratitude to Mike, then explaining the cause of their son's injury. He got hurt while trying to launch a super rocket by tying fireworks together with a group of friends which tragically backfired. Boys will be boys, Mike thought, reassuring the parents that their son would be alright. It's only after returning home that Mike realizes they are his neighbors across the street. The man's name is Oliver, and the woman Cheryl. Despite living there for two months, the two families had little interaction. Later, Mike enters his son Aaron's room to ask if he'd like something to eat before bed. Aaron doesn't respond, upset about his father bringing his girlfriend Brooke home for the night. Mike, a history professor at George Washington University, and his wife an FBI agent, once had a happy family. Tragically, his wife died in action, leaving father and son to rely on each other. Mike loves his son deeply and has refrained from marrying his girlfriend for his sake. Every year on the anniversary of his wife's death, they lay a rose in her memory a tradition joined by her former partner Hank. The next day, Mike and his family visit Oliver's home, where a family party is in full swing. Mike is warmly welcomed and learns during the barbecue that Oliver is an architect who grew up on a farm in Kansas and lived in St. Louis for four years before moving here. As the children play enthusiastically, Mike sees his son having fun for the first time since his wife's death. Oliver, deep in thought, remarks, We all need friends. Life is completely different without them. That evening, while sorting through mail, Mike finds a letter from the University of Pennsylvania addressed to Oliver. Thinking it's a simple mix-up, he hands it to Oliver, who is puzzled, and explains he graduated from Kansas State University in 1978. It must be an error. As Oliver receives a phone call, Mike notices architectural blueprints on the table and curiously starts to unfold them. Oliver quickly intervenes, vaguely explaining they are plans for the rest and shopping center. Back home, Mike shares his suspicions with his girlfriend. The blueprints weren't of a shopping center, but a large building. Why would Oliver lie about that? In his next class, Mike discusses a case of a terrorist attack that happened 14 months earlier in St. Louis. The perpetrator was a 33-year-old electrician named Dean, who, harboring resentment for being jailed over tax evasion, loaded his car with 23 kilograms of C4 and blew up a federal building. Despite conclusive evidence Mike suspects discrepancies, Dean was a friendly former soldier who had just received a pay raise two weeks before the incident which didn't add up. A student argues that the FBI had thoroughly investigated, but Mike believes this is just a way for the agency to placate the public. If terrorists were among them, people would be scared, feel unsafe, and distrust the government. Thus, finding a scapegoat was necessary. Who he was or whether he did it was irrelevant. What mattered was restoring a sense of safety and saving the government's face. That evening, Mike's and Oliver's families gather to celebrate their sons joining the same scout troop, bonding further over the previous life-saving incident. The conversation shifts from architecture to politics. Mike is relatively forgiving towards the government, but Oliver distrusts current politicians struggling to find one worth his vote. The discussion reminds Mike of his deceased wife whose death was caused by a departmental error, yet no one took responsibility. Overwhelmed, Mike steps outside to gather himself and Oliver follows to comfort him. The next day, Oliver takes the kids to play baseball and Aaron, Mike's son, is having a great time. Mike learns that Oliver talked to Aaron about his mother, a topic Aaron had always avoided and even instilled concepts of revenge in him. This raises Mike's suspicions about Oliver, feeling there's something secretive about him. The following day, Mike deliberately takes one of Oliver's letters still from the University of Pennsylvania, deepening his suspicions. He calls the university under the pretense of inquiring about Oliver's academic record. After some questioning, he learns that there was an Oliver at the university, but not his neighbor. Oddly, that person was the same age and from the same town. Further calls to Kansas State University reveal no record of Oliver, confirming Mike's suspicions. However, his girlfriend Brooke thinks Mike is overreacting, arguing that everyone lies sometimes, but it's not necessarily a big deal. Despite her view, Mike doesn't drop his investigation and finds Oliver's real name, William. In the 1970s, 78 Kansas State University Alumni Directory. Aaron tells his father about an upcoming scout troop spring trip but Mike refuses to let him go, not wanting him around Oliver's son which upsets Aaron. In his next class, Mike uses his wife's line of duty death as a case study, passionately blaming the tragedy on the Bureau's negligence. The next day, to avoid straining their relationship, Mike allows Aaron to attend the scout trip. Seeing Oliver again, Mike notices a smug smile on his face. Mike then discovers that on October 5, 1981, someone named William changed his name to Oliver and suspiciously a person named Oliver had died in Kansas the day before. Hank, his wife's former partner, says such actions are typically to hide one's past, creating a new history while erasing the old, often done by criminals. Mike wants Hank to investigate, but he refuses. Seizing the opportunity while Oliver's family is out, Mike rings their doorbell, claiming he forgot his keys and needs to borrow their phone. Oliver's daughter, wary at first, eventually lets him in after his persistent requests. Pretending to make a phone call, Mike searches Oliver's study but finds nothing. He notices a blueprint with a hidden layer on the wall, but is interrupted by Cheryl's return, forcing him to hastily leave after a brief explanation. 
Oliver's daughter follows Mike out, returning his bag and phone he had left behind. Mike manages an awkward smile. When Brooke returns home, she finds Mike waiting with his keys claiming he was pretending to wait for a locksmith as part of his act. Cheryl grows suspicious of Mike's earlier behavior, but he persists in his investigation. In a newspaper, Mike discovers Oliver's past. At 16 he attempted to blow up the Bureau of Land Management with a homemade bomb. Surprised by Oliver's sudden appearance, Mike hastily invents an excuse about searching for classroom materials. Oliver doesn't challenge him and leaves after a brief friendly chat. That evening Mike shares his findings with Brooke. He speculates that although Oliver was punished for his past attempt to bomb the Land Bureau, he might be planning something similar now. He suspects Oliver's involvement in the St. Louis Federal Building bombing 14 months earlier, especially since Oliver had mysterious architectural blueprints. Brooke finds Mike's theory absurd, leading to a heated argument. The next day, Oliver visits Mike, angrily confronting him about his intentions, but soon calms down and shares his past. The government had tried to seize his family's farm, which led to its bankruptcy and his father's suicide for insurance money to pay off debts. Oliver expresses frustration about being continually blamed for his teenage mistake, wishing it had never happened. Oliver leaves, telling Mike to be straightforward if he has issues with him. Brooke spots Oliver in a parking lot, acting suspiciously, and receiving a file from a woman before leaving. Recalling Mike's suspicions, she impulsively follows him to a global courier company, where she sees him with several metal boxes. Sensing something wrong, Brooke rushes to inform Mike, but is unaware she's being watched by an employee in red. Unable to reach Mike, she leaves a voicemail just as Cheryl ominously watches her. That night, while Mike is drinking and watching TV, a news report about a fatal car accident catches his attention. Shocked, he realizes the deceased driver is Brooke. He rushes to the crash site, grief-stricken and crying, but no miracle occurs. Oliver and Cheryl quickly come to comfort Mike, who apologizes for his previous suspicions. Following this, Mike becomes despondent, drowning his sorrows in alcohol. One morning, Hank calls Mike. Mike, wondering why he didn't answer calls or respond to messages on Friday. Mike is puzzled as he received no messages. Looking outside, he notices someone fixing the phone line and realizes Oliver must be behind it all. Mike quickly retreats to his garage to call Hank, sharing all his recent findings about Oliver and asking him to investigate Oliver's past before the name change. Convinced of a connection between Oliver and the bombing, Mike rushes to St. Louis to investigate further. In St. Louis, Mike visits the apartment of Dean, the perpetrator of the earlier bombing, and meets his father. The old man, who had moved several times since the incident, is agitated by Mike's visit. He insists that his son was kind-hearted, often donating to orphanages and scout troops. He asserts that his son would never harm children, as there was a daycare near the site of the bombing. This mention of the scouts unsettles Mike, and he's shown a photo of Dean camping with the scouts, linking everything to Oliver. Anxious about his son Aaron, who is currently at a scout camp, Mike rushes out and hitches a ride to the airport, calling the camp's leader en route to ensure Aaron's safety. Arriving at the camp in the evening, Mike is told that Aaron and Oliver's son were picked up in the afternoon by someone claiming to be Aaron's panic. Mike drives back home. Outside Oliver's house, he sees many cars and a party underway. Confronting Oliver about kidnapping his son, Oliver calmly admits to abducting Aaron and murdering Brooke as they interfered with his plans. He assures Mike that Aaron won't be harmed as long as Mike doesn't disrupt their plans, leaving Mike uncertain whether to trust this murderous terrorist. The next day, Hank informs Mike that Oliver's name change is legal and his record is clean. However, Hank mentions two calls to Mike on Friday, one from him and another from a public phone at the Penkland Trading Center, which Mike believes might be a clue. Renting a car, Mike arrives at the Penkland Trading Center early in the morning. He spots a delivery van, similar to one parked at Oliver's house the previous night. Observing from a distance, Mike sees several people who attended Oliver's party loading metal boxes, possibly bombs, into the van. Renting a car, Mike arrives at the Penkland Trading Center early in the morning. He spots a delivery van, similar to one parked at Oliver's house the previous night. Observing from a distance, Mike sees several people who attended Oliver's party loading metal boxes possibly bombs into the van. The van drives into an alley where Oliver confronts Mike, pulls him from his car and beats him, dragging him into an abandoned warehouse. Oliver informs his accomplices that he has caught the tail and instructs them to proceed with the plan. He brags about millions of supporters Mike can't stop. Mike manages to break free and subdue Oliver, demanding he call off the bombing. However, Oliver smashes the walkie-talkie and refuses to cancel the plan to bomb the FBI headquarters. In a desperate move, Mike calls Hank to evacuate the building, warning of a bomb in a white delivery van. Unbeknownst to Mike, Oliver steps outside, uses a walkie talkie and utters, begin the operation, indicating Mike has been deceived. Mike follows the delivery van to the FBI headquarters, but surprisingly the guards at the entrance don't stop it. In a frantic state, Mike screams about the bomb in the van. Hank arrives and instructs the guards not to shoot, understanding the gravity of the situation. Despite being held at gunpoint, Mike is determined to save his son and rushes inside. Upon exiting his car, Mike is surrounded by FBI agents. He insists they check the van for a bomb, but the outcome is not what he expected. The van's rear is empty, with no bomb or errand, and the driver isn't the same as before. Hank reveals the van had permission to enter, and everyone except Mike had clearance. Suddenly realizing something, Mike dashes to his rented car and opens the trunk, finding a C4 bomb planted there. The bomb detonates, leveling the entire building. Meanwhile, Aaron steps out of a white delivery van, still caught up in the joy of playing with his friends. News reports quickly declare the explosion an act of terrorism. 
labeling Mike as the terrorist seeking revenge on the FBI for his wife's death. His students corroborate this theory, recalling how Mike often discussed terrorist crimes in class and sometimes became emotionally unstable, supposedly due to his wife's death. All of Mike's past statements are scrutinized and even a saint couldn't escape such judgment. The case is closed, branding the brilliant professor a terrorist. With Mike's death, Aaron is adopted, but Oliver's plans don't stop there. He waits for the next location, with an even larger conspiracy unfolding. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this.